Good evening, welcome to our service. Uh, we're glad to be with you tonight. And uh, we want to welcome you to Word and Sword TV broad, uh, broadcast. And uh, we want to thank you so much for inviting us into your home. I'm Stan Adams. I preach at the Lincoln Church of Christ, and I'm uh, do, continuing to do the program here at Newton. And um, glad to be with you in your home this evening. We want you to call in tonight with any Bible questions you may have. Uh, call and ask for a copy of this presentation. Ask for a free Bible correspondence course that is being offered. It's a good way to study the Bible, a good way to get, uh, get to be a better Bible student. And I know many of you who have been viewing the program have taken the correspondence course, but there's nothing wrong with taking it again, uh, keeping your information renewed and fresh on your mind. And uh, call in, if you will, this evening at 828-485-5555 and ask for a free, free Bible correspondence course. It won't cost you a dime. And also you can ask for a free tract, which is a written uh, sermon on any number of subjects that you might have. <clears throat> and if we do not answer your question like you would like for us to, from God's Word, maybe it's not as extensive an answer as you would like, then let us know and we will send you more information uh, on, those, on that subject. Also, you can call in and ask for a map to our building if you don't have GPS. And also, you can ask to be added to the quarterly Beacon's uh, mailing list. Beacon is the bulletin of the Newton Church of Christ. <clears throat> you can get free Bible study aids also uh, to help you in your Bible study to know more of what God's Word says. A number of sermons are posted there, a number of links on our website. And it's a pretty good website, a very extensive website. If you want to go to www.wordandsword.com and uh, access any of that information that's there for your uh, Bible study enjoyment. And we urge you to do that. <clears throat> now tonight, if you will, uh, those of you who are just now tuning in and uh, you haven't been watching, we're glad to have you. And we hope you'll stay with us as we go through our program tonight. We're going to be talking about contemporary worship versus the old time religion. And uh, what the old paths of the Bible say and what the contemporary music of today says. We're going to be using several different sources, some of them on the contemporary music aspect and the contemporary worship aspect that are not uh, from the Bible because contemporary worship isn't from the Bible. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that and do we want to have contemporary worship? Well certainly in some senses yes and in some senses no. Uh, the Bible has certainly, God has fashioned worship to where it will be pleasing and should be pleasing to all generations. Now call in tonight with your Bible question. Also you will receive a biblical book chapter and verse answer. We are limping along a little bit tonight. We have a little bit of technical issues that will not allow you to be on the program live. But if you do have a Bible question, please call in and get it to one of our operators. They will bring it up to me and we will do our best to answer your question. We just won't have a back and forth uh, like sometimes we do on live, live programming. <clears throat> so. If you will, call in with your Bible question and leave it with one of our operators and call and ask for the uh, Bible correspondence course. You can also like us on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com and we'll put that up for you. www.facebook.com slash word and sword and you can uh, post a comment up there if you would like. And also we have another website at www.facebook.com slash Newton, North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina capitalized and Newton North uh, Newton capitalized, and then Church of Christ. You can follow us on Twitter and uh, post a, a a tweet up there if you would like at Word and Sword. And again, we are all about finding out what the Bible says about our Bible questions. If the Bible uh, addresses your question, we will do our best to find that and uh, get that answer to you. Now we asked some. Uh, some questions the other day about a, a man uh, on our last program. We asked questions uh, for you and for your kids for your own Bible study. We asked a question about a man whose um, father was not mentioned in his genealogy. Only his mother was. Who was that? <clears throat> and that was Joab uh, in, the, in the Bible. The answer to that is Joab. And he was one of the ones that was uh, a follower, uh, very close to, uh, you know, there was Joab and Abner, and one was close to, to David, and one was close to Saul, 
And uh, but Joab is the is the man mentioned in the scripture that does not have his father mentioned in his genealogy, but has his mother uh, follows his mother's genealogy. The New Church of Christ would like to invite you to a gospel meeting. They're going to have a gospel meeting June the 14th through the 16th. And the speaker will be Alex Caldwell. I've known Alex for a number of years, and I know Alex preaches the gospel. And he will come there and preach it in its truth and its simplicity. 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. 828 465 3009 is the number at the building. And also, you can go to contact at wordandsword.com if you need a ride or if there's any questions you have about how to get to the building or anything like that. We would be glad to help you with that. But that meeting will start on Friday and Saturday and then Sunday, June the 14th through the 16th. His subjects will be on Friday night at 7 o'clock, church, social meals, and recreation. So Friday night at 7 o'clock, church, social meals, and recreation. And on Saturday he, at 7 o'clock, he will preach on loyalty, our loyalty to the Lord. On Sunday at 9.30, he'll preach on the value of attendance at our worship. That's something that all churches need, about the value of attendance. Uh, so many think that they can just serve God in the deer stand, you know. But how important it is to get together with our brethren, and how important that is from God's wor Word and what it says. Uh, Sunday at 11 a.m., uh, he will conclude the meeting with the subject of we are so unworthy, and certainly truer words were never spoken about our unworthiness before the Lord. We are as but rags before the Lord. And he'll be ending the meeting on that. So we invite all of our friends who may be involved in activities like he's going to preach on Sunday or Friday night to make sure you come 7 o'clock uh, church social meals and recreation. One of the reasons we had Brother Caldwell come is because he used to be a person that was just loved involving himself in those things and was a proponent of them and preached about them in favor of them. But now he has changed and come out of that and he gives some benefit of some understanding about what caused him to do that as he began to examine the scripture and examine his practices with what the Bible said. One of those honest souls, Brother Caldwell is, who was unashamed to say when he found himself to be in error that I've been wrong. And so he has come out of that and he will do an excellent job of presenting God's Word to, the, to us down at the Newton Church of Christ at 7 o'clock uh, on sa Friday and Saturday and then regular service times on Sunday. So www.wordandsword.com is the website. The phone number that you, will, that you will call tonight if you would like to call us is 828-485-5555 and be ready to call in. I already had some calls come in and we appreciate that so much. So let's keep the calls coming in, any Bible question you have. And um, we want to ask you <clears throat> if you have done what this chart says here. Are you saved? Like the Bible says. Let's come back to the chart, Davis please. And many others felt about the whole circus collusion. How desperate? Well, did he let a key witness's child porn charges fall by the wayside? In All right. Have you done what this chart says? On this Russian nonsense? Have you heard the gospel? Well, most people have. John 12, 48. And all these passages we have listed here are what Jesus said about salvation. We must hear. We must hear Him. We must hear the Lord and do what He has told us to do. We must believe it. At John 8, 24, except you believe I am He, you'll die in your sins. And then repentance. Repentance is all necessary. God commands men everywhere to come to repentance. We must confess. If we confess Christ before men, He will confess us before His Father. We must be baptized. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that disbelieves shall be condemned. And then Matthew 24, verse 13, we must continue faithfully all through our life. We, he that is faithful will receive a crown of life. So we must be faithful. All of these passages that are noted are the words of Jesus, my friend. And this is what Jesus said all of us must do to be saved today. Under the new law, 
that came into effect after he died on the cross and back in 30, about 30, 33 AD. So think seriously about whether you've done this. If you haven't or if you have questions about whether you've done these things, then please get with us and let us know so we can study God's Word more clearly and understand. And if we're wrong on this, let's uh, certainly make sure that we are willing, that, like Brother Caldwell was, to make sure that we are ready to come out of our error and admit our error and not try to gloss it over in any way, shape, or form. All right, you can come back to me now, if you will. All right. There is a subject we'll be dealing with tonight that we've already prefaced and told you a little bit about, about a movement that is taking place in the religious world. It's a movement that is not uh, a discriminator. It is something that is happening in all religious groups today. And it is, and you'll see signs up, it has been the source for much division going all the way back to the 70s actually. Uh, the division that would come from the idea of the coffee shop, uh, kind of the beatnik type of attitude toward serving the Lord. Uh, back in the 70s I remember there were some people that wanted to make God a regular guy. Uh, that let's just make God a regular guy like us. And when they would pray to him, I've heard this prayer, particularly at a ball game I was at, on a team, and this was the prayer that was offered, sacrilegious. We wanted that we had some food brought in, and what was said was rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub, yea God. That's blasphemous. And I told the individual that did that years ago how blasphemous that was. And he laughed about it and said, ah, whatever, and went on. But the effort to try to bring God down to our standards, to our way of thinking, rather than to elevate ourselves to God's way of thinking, to bring God down to our, even in our worship service, to where our worship is basically designed around the idea of what we get out of it, instead of what we give to the Lord in our worship. And what God wants goes out the window in all too many cases. There's an assault on scriptural worship. The Journal of American, uh, uh, the American Academy of Ministry uh, said this is what's happening. And here's a quote from what they said. And I'll just put this up here for you to look at. Keep the mood. The tempo of worship must be upbeat. Resist minor keys. They're too somber. Discard churchy anthems and hymns. Provide sermons with catchy how-to titles. Encourage casual dressing and informal ambience. And the new model for efficiency and friendliness and enthusiasm in worship is Walt Disney World. Now, friends, does that sound familiar to you? Are you having some battles with these types of things where you go to church? This is called contemporary worship. It's a movement that is designed, and you can come back to the chart if you will. It's a movement that is, that is designed to get people to be more entertained than they are fed spiritual things. It's the movement that says we must come back to some type of, we must get to a point where we become relevant to people today. Now remember, notice the source for this. This is the Journal of American, the American Academy of Ministry overall. Now when they are saying that the new model for efficiency and friendliness and enthusiasm in worship is Walt Disney World, and so we have to make everybody comfortable, all of our guests, all of our people should be made comfortable with what they're doing. We don't want to rattle anybody's cage, we want to cater to everyone. Then what we're getting into is amusement park religion, contemporary religion. Now in a book by Dave Miller called Piloting the Strait on page 182, this is what he says, once you have the correct actions in place for worship, where the real effort comes in is keeping your heart and mind focused on what you're doing. Worship in spirit takes real work. It takes real effort. 
It takes mental and physical preparation, but unfortunately the current climate in churches tends to treat worship as a time for entertaining the worshiper and catering to the worshiper's wants. And so consequently, worshipers have lost that deep, reverent mindset that approaches the worship assembly with a sense of respect and cautious intent to please God. Now friends, that's from a secular book, but isn't that, isn't that interesting? Where he is calling on his contemporary cohorts to recognize that they've gotten away from the real effort of true worship. And that it does take effort to please the Lord like he wants to be pleased. Now let's look at the definition in the Bible for how we worship. Not just worship, but worship properly. And we'll find that in the definition of the word proskuneo, or proskuneo, uh, by Thayer, and uh, the Thayer's definition number is G4352. On the word worship, this is what Thayer says. It means to kiss the hand toward, in token of reverence. Notice the term reverence that is used there. Among the Orientals, Thayer goes on to say in his second definition, especially the Persians, it meant to fall on the knees and touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence and emptying of self, he goes on to say. Number three, in the New Testament, by kneeling or prostration to do homage to one or make obeisance, whether in order to express, express respect or to make a supplication. He went on to say it's used of homage shown to men and beings of superior rank. Now, that is the Bible definition, friends, of the word worship. Now we see in that definition, to kiss the hand toward, in token of reverence. Notice the word reverence that is there. To, and, and in the idea of bowing your head all the way to the ground, in profound, or notice again, reverence, and in the New Testament by kneeling and making obeisance to express respect and awe and supplication to God as the object, particularly when used in relation to religion. Homage to men and beings of superior rank. Friends, we have been in the last few, de few decades, we've been creeping closer and closer to the idea that there is no one greater than us, that all of us are equal before everyone else. There is no such thing as rank. There is no, no such thing as the boss. There is no, no such thing as a master over us. There is no such thing as a person who holds authority to, over us like a policeman or like somebody that's in law enforcement. Law has been uh, relegated to a joke to many people and those who are involved in the uh, enforcement of the law should be respected in that but yet they've been belittled. The idea of respect, reverence, awe and proper fear of the law is something that has in the last few decades has been eroding and we're paying a price for it now. In homes the idea of the husband being the head of the home and the wife being submissive to her husband is almost blasphemy to people today in the liberal world that we live in uh, to, to, very, to even suggest that a woman needs to be in subjection to her husband. And that doesn't mean that he's to be a dictator over the house and uh, he's supposed to walk around like a, like a dictator like Hitler. That's not what we're talking about. It's not biblical. But Christ ordained in Ephesians 5 that the husband be the head of the house, that the wife be submissive to her own husband, that the husband love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So there's a mutuality there. There's an equality, but yet there is a rank. God made man first, and he made woman second. And as we see that rank, we see that homage that is to be paid, the woman is to respect her husband because he is the head of the house. God put him there. 
And in the church, we know that elders are heads in the church. They are to be respected for their position in the church. They're not to be worshiped, but they are to be held in high regard, honored to whom honor is due. When we get into our political systems that we're in, the governor, the mayor, those in positions of leadership over us and rule over us, they should be respected for the office. Now the person may be an absolute reprobate. Nero, I'm, I would remind you, was the ruler of Rome during the time that Paul was writing most of the, most of the epistles. And Paul was killed by Nero. But yet it was Jesus who said when Caesar was in power, Caesar Augustus, when that was taking place, it is Jesus when asked the question, should you pay taxes to Rome? He said, yes. Yes. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, that, that, anybody that knows anything about Roman history, you go back and look. These were wicked men. Almost, to a per, to, almost exactly each one of them had their own problems. But they were wicked men. But they were in positions of headship. And the Lord tells us to recognize Romans 13, Paul wrote that you must re respect the laws of the land for they are put in place as a fear to the evildoer and as a friend to the righteous. And that is God's role for government. God ordained government, friends. But we are growing up in the last few decades where there's been an eroding, or an eroding of respect and reverence and awe for those that rule over us. Now when we come to our worship services, what we have done in our, in our worship, and you would have never thought this would have happened, we have come to a point now where people almost act as if God is just somebody like their friend down the road or like their dog, and that you know you, you, you pet him on the head every now and then and tell him that he's a good dog and everything's going to be fine. You tell God that you're glad that he's doing what he's doing, but you don't need him right now to run along. And that's the attitude, and that's the God that many people want to serve today. And as a result of that, when they're called upon to honor God in some way, they honor him like people would at a parade for a dignitary of some kind. And they do not give God the honor and the respect that God is due and Jesus is due. And so that, that's long gone. On the word proskuneo, Vine goes on to uh, Vine says, to make obeisance, to do reverence, from pros, which means toward, and kineo, which means to kiss or to kiss toward. Now, proskuneo is the most frequent word rendered to worship. It's used of an act or a homage of reverence to God. Matthew 4 and verse 10, you must hear the Lord. He is to be honored. John 4, 21, 1 Corinthians 14, 24, God's a spirit. You must worship in spirit and in truth. Talking about Christ, we see there in Matthew 2 and verse 2, and also in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, his, wonder shall, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father. He is Emmanuel which means God with us. And I tell you, God holds a position of authority and rank over us and God tells us what we need to do to please Him. We don't tell Him what He needs to do to please us. Do you see the difference? We all see that, don't we? We don't bark out orders and call God into our room and say, guess what God, you need to line up this way before I'm going to do anything for you. No, no. We need to hit our knees, get down on our knees, put our face to the ground, and bow humbly before our God and say, how much can I do for you? What would you have me to do? So how we worship, friends, is as important as if we worship. Now, certainly there are those people today that wouldn't give God the time of day in any, in any way, shape, or form. But notice that the proper action God requires of all of us in John chapter 4 and verse 24, he says there that God is a spirit. And those who worship him, God, must, notice the imperative, a must, it's not a suggestion, it's not an option. They must worship in spirit and in truth. So the proper action is worship. 
Worship of who? Of God. The proper object is God. And then the proper attitude is in spirit. And the proper authority is according to the truth. All right? So I must give my whole spirit to God in my worship. And notice the aspect of giving, not of taking. I give to God in my worship. I'm not there to be appeased. God is there to be honored. And I am to offer honor and praise and glory to God. I am not to sit back and say, you haven't pleased me. Because I'm not the one that's the object of the worship. So if some people are there at worship trying to be pleased themselves and how, how I come away and how I feel about God is dependent upon how you make me feel. Oh no. We've got it all backwards there, don't we? So worship to God in spirit and in truth with everything I have. Now it's important also how we worship. Psalm 5 and verse 7, notice this. But as for me, David says, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. You see the reverence there? You see the obeisance? You see the humility? Where someone comes into God's sight and says, I will bow down to you. I will not expect you to bow to my whims, but I will bow to yours. I will be pleased with what I give to you as you are pleased to accept it. In Psalm 95 and verse 6, the psalmist says here, O come and let us worship and let us bow down and let us kneel. You see those three actions? Before the Lord our Maker. Those are all involved in the word in both Hebrew and in Greek of worshiping and bowing down and kneeling before the Lord. That is obeisance. That's reverence. In Psalm 96 and verse 9, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That means our hearts must be tuned to holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. That means there needs to be a proper respect, a proper demeanor, a proper attitude when we do worship. So the how of our worship does matter, friends. Not just if we give something to God and call it worship. It must be done according to the way that God has set it out. In Leviticus 10 in verse 3, friends, it says there, And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. And so Aaron held his peace. So God expects his people to honor him and regard him as holy and reverend. That's, by the way, that's the only, God is the only one you should ever call a reverend, okay? Because it is his name that is reverend, no one else's. Well, Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you'll build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one I will look, on the one who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my words. Now what does that say? Now friends, you know the contemporary people say we shouldn't be at least bit fearful of God. And I know what, they, what they're getting at with that. There's no way that we're supposed to just uh, run away every time we hear God's name mentioned. You can come back to me now. We shouldn't run away from God and we shouldn't be absolutely scared of God, but we should be fearful of God. We should fear Him, and that word fear means, uh, can mean, causing awe and respect and evoking a response to God of thankfulness and obeisance to Him. Thank you for caring about me, God. Well, there are those who say that if we, if we have the least bit of fear of God, that we can't worship Him properly. And just the opposite is true, friends. Without a proper fear of God, you cannot worship according to His will. He will be honored. He will be revered. He will be elevated and exalted in our worship. And just chanting out words 
and the music overwhelming it and the fog machines going 100 miles an hour and the effects machines and all the mood music and everything else is not something that gives God the proper honor. It is not reverent, it is irreverent. And so it does not show the proper humility before God. But more the idea of a concert, of a Walt Disney World, as the writer said. In Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29, you have your Bibles? Okay, turn to Hebrews 12 and verse 28 and 29. It's always good to get air between our pages here. And uh, weather's settling down a little bit, pollen's going away. So it's good to always sit out and read our Bibles. I was out, out a, up at Moses Cone on the Blue Ridge the other day, and there's some people that came, said they just came out to read. You know what they're reading? They're reading their Bible. What a great example that was. To sit over in your lawn chair out in God's nature and read your Bible. Now, were they worshiping God? No, they were serving God, but they were not worshiping God. And there is this problem that we have today in contemporary worship circles, that everything we do is worship to God. There are those who would say that when you change a baby's diaper that you are worshiping God. When you take your dog for a walk, you're worshiping God. Well, that is certainly a righteous person doing something that is good to do. And that is service, but all service is not worship. But all worship is service. Okay, do you get that? So there are a number of things. When a husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gives himself for her, he is certainly serving the Lord, but he's not worshiping the Lord in that way. So we need to get away from this idea that everything we do is worship. What that does, that takes us away from an assembly. That gives us the attitude that many have that you can worship God just as well up in the deer stand. No, God's fashion and God ordained before time that when people come together to worship Him that they come together to do so. You remember in the Old Testament, even in the patriarchal period, before the law of Moses, when Abraham was walking along and doing his daily travel, he was serving the Lord in that. But Abraham would pause and the scripture changes the word. And he would bow down to the Lord and offer an altar, build an altar, and he would offer sacrifice to God. That was different from him walking with God every day. So we should all walk with God every day. But every bit of service that we give to God in our walk daily is not worship. But our worship is certainly service to God. So we must recognize there are times in our lives where God has said it is good for us to pause and spend time with just Him and with, our, with those of like faith. Abraham in the patriarchal age would have offered for his whole family. So in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now that is not meant to scare us to death, but it is meant to let us understand the capacity that God has not only to lift us up, but also to destroy us if He so chooses. God's capacity that He has right now to destroy everything that, that, that breathes in, a, in one breath or less, that is an awesome power He has, and it is worthy of honor and respect and obeisance and worship when we realize who He is. He's a good God, but He is also a just God. And the very idea that he has not called it all to an end yet is a tribute to his long suffering and his mercy and his grace. And certainly those are themes that have something to do with God. But friends, when we give our God our praise and our honor related to those things, we do not just throw away our relationship to God and act as if we are God's equals and that we can stand toe to toe with him and that we can outdo him maybe. That's not the proper homage that we should have to God. Is there such a thing, friends, as false worship? Is there any way that a person could worship God 
in some way that may be pleasing to them and may be pleasing to a lot of people. The crowds or the masses may accept it as praise to God and yet it be wrong. Is there any such thing in the Bible as false worship? Well, I think if you just look over with Jesus, you would find the answer again in Matthew chapter 15 and verses 7 through 9. And if you have your Bibles, let's go turn over there. Matthew 15 and verses 7 through 9. And if you don't have your Bible, you can look on the screen here. He says here to the Pharisees, who arguably were the most religious people of the day, and argument could be made of all time. They were guardians of the law. And they did a pretty good job of that. But they went way past on a number of things. He, he calls them hypocrites. He says, I today a well prophesied about you, saying these people draw near to me with their lip, with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips. Watch this. But their heart's far from me. And in emptiness or vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Now friends, what's wrong with contemporary worship? Why would the Bible, why would God not endorse it? Because it is a commandment of men. It is following the whims of men and not the ways of God. The Pharisees, notice, they honored the Lord. They draw near with the mouth and they honored him with their lips. They gave some type of praise to God. But what was the problem? Their heart was far from him. They were performing. They were doing their actions. They were pleasing themselves. They were doing what they thought they should do. And they were on a power trip and that's what happened. There was no sincerity to it. It was let's get through this, let's get through that, let's do this, let's do that, and therefore then God owes us since we have done these things for him. Well friends, contemporary worship is little more than a rock concert. And there is the attitude that many have today of singing, singing the congregation. And that is one of the aspects of contemporary worship. And that is where the mood is set with the, with the music. And if you'll notice a lot of the contemporary services now, you'll find the music never stops. There is a rise or a fall in the tone and in the volume, but it always continues. You ever wonder about that? Well, let me tell you what, what's there. There's whole psychology involved with that. That's where music is setting the tone for the feelings of the people. It's a type of, of, mind, of mind control. But what it does, and as the person is making the appeal, the songs of contemporary worship, they are some of the most empty expressions you'll ever see. They are the expressions, vain repetitions, and the Bible talks about that, where they, if somebody gets involved in vain repetitions, and they say the same things over and over and over and over and over again and over. You see that? That's an overemphasis on certain expressions. And what that does is it gets kind of a mindset, a mind numbing that goes on to where the person begins to give way to only their feelings. And they want to feel something. And they want some type of supercharge. They want some type of caffeine rush in their spiritual feelings. They have come to church services not to learn what God says, not to pay homage to God, but to feel good. And that's what contemporary worship offers. It makes people feel good. But notice with the Pharisees in Matthew 15, they certainly felt like their worship was okay, but their hearts were not in it. So their worship was vain. It is such, there is a, such a thing in the Bible as your worship being toward God, but it being off base, empty worship to God. Now, could you worship God without contemporary worship and be just as wrong? and have this same thing? Yes, you could. You certainly could. 
if your heart is not in your worship. So contemporary worship is not the only area where a person's heart couldn't be in their worship. Same thing could be true of all in the old paths, but your heart would not be in your worship. You would not be honoring the old paths. So we have to be careful in both instances that we understand that our hearts must be in our worship. Now, are, are there people, let's ask this question, are there people who worship God that have, are going according to the pattern, but they're doing it as a checklist? Well, okay, it's time to sing song number such and such. Okay, let's get that over. Oh, we got that one done. Now let's go to the next one. Okay, we got that one done. Now let's go to this prayer and let's get that done. Now let's take care of this communion. Let's get that done. Now let's give this money. Let's get that done. And will that preacher ever finish? Let's get this done. And okay, God, hope you're happy. Is that, is that right? Well, no, no one would argue that. And is it possible that some people look upon worship that way? Yes. Is it possible that that type of abuse has given rise to an overreaction to that with contemporary worship concepts? Yes, there is that possibility. And it is a rebellion, it's an overreach from an abuse of proper worship. But there, that, just because somebody has abused proper worship does not mean proper worship went away, friends. Our worship can be empty. Our worship can be vain. In Ezekiel 33, in verse 31, So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people. And they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouths they show much love. But with their hearts they pursue their own gains their own feelings. They are there to be served, not to serve, but to be served, to be entertained. They come, they sit, they hear, but they have no intention of changing. And again, this is in a context where people were, uh, the prophet is talking to people that have grown cold in their worship to God. Now friends, this may describe what happens where you worship, be it contemporary or be it some other way, where people come, they sit down before you and they hear the words of the Lord, but they have no intention of the scriptures changing them at all. Ezekiel 33, 31, again, a very vital passage about worship. We cannot come to worship God and have an attitude that I'm just come to go through a show or go through the ritual and then get it over with and go do what I want to. If that's what worship is to you, you have worshiped in vain. And that's true whether it's contemporary worship or whether it is, as we would call it, traditional worship. We have to come with the attitude of letting God's Word change us and being glad that it has praising God for the revealing of our sins, that we will have an opportunity to change them so we will not be separated. Their hearts have come to pursue their own interests, not the interests of God. Again, if you do not have Ezekiel 33, 31 underlined in your Bible, do so. And do not ever be involved in that behavior when you worship your Lord and God honestly, as the scripture says. There's a way in which you could worship God that is called hypocritical worship. Matthew 21 and verse 22, they praised God with their mouth. They dishonored him with their deeds. Their deeds were authorized by men and not by God. So he says here in Matthew 21, 25, they have praised me. They did that with their mouths. But their deeds have shown that they're not in this. They want to do things authorized of men and throw it at God and say, this is what you must accept, God. He said, no. In Luke 6, 46, there were those who respected the Lord, but those who respect the Lord, Luke says, will seek to honor him in his way. 
Do you seek to honor God the way He wants to be honored? Have we ever considered when it comes to our worship what God says about our worship? Because God knows what's best to, uh, for us to do to honor Him, doesn't He? And do you know you can search your Bible from the front to the back and you'll never see anything that says that we should honor God and praise God by putting on a concert? By having some type of uh, loud music and fog machines and all types of visuals and laser shows and all that. In John chapter 14, verse 15, 21 and 23 through 24, the ones who love the Lord will seek to obey the Lord. We must obey God and not men. And friends, in all too many cases where contemporary worship is reigning in worship assemblies, so-called worship assemblies today, what you're finding is people that are serving themselves. They're not serving God. And you're finding people that are catering to get a crowd. They're not coming to worship. They're trying to raise a crowd. And that crowd by itself and the frenzy that the crowd may get in, albeit maybe controlled, maybe not, is that which gives them their charge, so to speak, their spiritual charge, to be able to go out and serve God the next day. Now, the only thing wrong with that is it's the wrong way. Okay? God didn't authorize it. In John 14, you got your Bibles? Again, get your Bible, John 14, look at verse 15. If you love me, the Lord says, do what? Keep my commandments. Look at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21. He that hath, that hath my commandments and keeps them then, he is he that loves me. For he that loves me shall be loved of God, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Now look at verses 23 through 26. The Lord answered, If a man loves me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's that sent me. These things I have spoken to you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whoever I have said and whatever I have said unto you. So the Lord continued to reveal to us through the Spirit, through men writing things down, the Lord has revealed to us all things we need to know right here, particularly in the 27 books of the New Testament for us today. The Old Testament, Romans 15 verse 4, is written for our learning to bring us to the things of Christ. And Galatians chapter 3, the Old Testament is a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. All right, so we have what we need to know how to honor God properly, don't we? And Jesus said that if you love me, you'll do what? You'll do what I say. And you'll not argue about it. You'll not get in a fuss about it. You'll not second guess God and say, well, you know, God, we're kind of contemporary now and you're kind of old fashioned. And, you know, it might have been okay to honor you that way back in the past, but we want to honor you in a new way. We want to give you praise this way. We want to honor you and give you reverence this way. When in essence, that is not the motive. The motive is performing. Now, friends, you may say, well, what in the world does a preacher know about performance? Well, I used to be in a band and I know how to play music and I know how to help involve myself in helping pump up a crowd. And there is a time for that in secular music and there's nothing wrong with that done within the parameters that you need to do and not seeking some type of sensual exercise. But at the same time, friends, there is a time and a place for that and it is not in worship. If you were to come to the Church of Christ, you would find many people that are able to perform. They've been in bands. They've been involved in performances. In churches, in many cases, in their past lives. 
and they understand what what contemporary music and the, the appeal of that all is but it's all about volume in many cases it's all about mood setting it's all about frenzies it's all about mind uh, manipulation and that's all what all what it's about get the people to a certain point and depending on who the group is it's all about selling the product did you know that contemporary worship is an industry multi-million dollar industry the bands that are involved the people that are professionals that make their money the Dove Awards that are given to the greatest performers in uh, gospel, as they say, music. All of that is a multi-million dollar business. Now, let me just ask you this. Suppose you're a small group and you can't afford to have these professional people come in. Can you still have contemporary music and contemporary worship? And you know what's happening? The small churches are piping it in. They're buying the rights to the performances. They're playing them on the overheads, on the, on the transparencies, and on the PowerPoints. And they're playing it on the great big charts, and then they're having the manipulation of the mood of the service be their part. They're making that their worship. Again, people are selling contemporary worship rights to smaller churches so they can have what the bigger churches have. Well, is that working? We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. In Acts 17 and verse 22 through 23, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus at that time. He's in Athens, Greece. And he said, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you're religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So the one whom you worship without really knowing, he is the one I proclaim to you. You know, ignorant worship is also possible. You can have empty worship, you can have ignorant worship, and friends, the worship of God is revealed in the New Testament. In Romans 10:17. We see there that the faith of God, the, the foolishness of preaching, the way in which God sustains his preaching and his word is through the teaching of the gospel. True worship is revealed worship. So we must do the things God has told us to do in the way God has told us to do it. There are a lot of people today that are crying out, you know, we want to, we want to get with it. We want to be a part of the new new cutting edge religion and they're telling the old people to get out of the way faith comes by hearing Romans 10 17 and hearing by the word of God friends that's been true for years and it will never change our faith comes by hearing and our true worship is found in the hearing of God's word in Acts 23 verse 21 or verse 1 in Acts chapter 26 and verse 9, we see there that there are those who are sincere in their worship, but they're doing so in a wrong way. All right? So it's possible to sincerely worship God in some ways, but to be totally wrong in what you're doing. We see there that Paul says about his life in verse 9, Acts 26 and verse 9, I barely thought within myself, he says, that I should do many things that were contrary to the name of Jesus. Now was Paul sincere? Yes, he did all things he did in good conscience, Acts 23, 1. But he says, I really thought with, with my most sincere thoughts that I really should do many things that were contrary to what God wanted me to do. Now friends, is that possible today? Is it possible for you to do those things? To be sincere in what you're doing, but to be sincerely wrong? Yeah. You can be insincerely wrong, but you can certainly be sincerely wrong. Not realize that what you've been doing is not what God would have you to do. Ignorant worship, friends, prevents true worship. 
Romans chapter 10 that we were in just a few minutes ago and looking at verses 1 through 3, Romans 10 and verses 1 through 3. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn over there. Romans chapter 10 and verses 1 through 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay? So he says here, they have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. <clears throat> we can be taken away by zeal and think that that somehow, if a person's zealous about something, they have to be right. See? And be overwhelmed by that concept. And that's the contemporary appeal. That if you feel good about something, then it's right. Even though it's done out of ignorance. You don't have the knowledge of God in your practice because it's not authorized by God. Okay. Well, in Colossians 2, in verse 20 through 23, Paul says to the Colossians, Do you subject yourself to regulations, which all concern things that perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and the neglect of the body, but they're of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. So there's a self-imposed religion that we could have. And it would be false. He says so here. They have an appearance of that which is good. They seem to be right. It seems right to us, you see. But he says in self-imposed religion, in false humility, okay, that's doing things that please us and then expecting God to be thrilled to death with it. just not going to happen, friends. God will be worshipped the way God says to worship him, or he'll not be praised and honored in any other venue. The approach many take regarding worship today <clears throat> is this, and let me ask you if this sounds familiar. Look at this chart. I think it should be such and such. I feel it just sure seems to me like well you know my heart is uplifted and if I feel good about it how can it be so wrong you remember how Miss Boone Debbie Boone a few years ago how could something so right seem so wrong well the fact is something can seem right and be very wrong Many offer as a defense, well, the Bible doesn't say I can't. The Bible doesn't say I can't bring my electric guitar down and blow the, blow the speakers every Sunday. Well, no, it doesn't. But what does the Bible say? say not what the Bible doesn't say. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, you remember Nadab and Abihu? Remember those two guys? <clears throat> why, were they, why were they involved in losing their life? What happened? They were the sons of Aaron. What happened to them? Well, they did that which was without authority. Now, had God told the priests, had he told them how to get the fire, how the fire was to be kindled? Yes. And do you know where it was supposed to come from? It was supposed to come from a place where the embers were saved from the other fires. And there was a perpetual fire that was carried along in the, in the, uh, as they traveled. And there were those who were to keep it. It was a perpetual fire. And every time something was done with fire, it was to come from that source. Well, Nadab and Abihu in, Luke, in uh, Leviticus 10, notice what it says, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense therein, and offered strange fire before the Lord, that he did not command them. And what happened? Fire came down from the Lord, and he devoured them. And they died before the Lord. 
So Nadab and Abihu, they thought that they could do that. They were priests. And they didn't think it made any difference where the fire came from. Fire is fire, right? God didn't say you couldn't. But what God did say mattered, didn't it? What about King Saul who presumed to offer sacrifice to the people or for the people? Well, did he have that right? No. Did God say who was supposed to offer sacrifice? Yes. And it was those of the tribe of Levi. And it was Samuel in that case. A king, Saul, from the tribe of Benjamin had no right to offer a sacrifice for the people. But he presumed that he did. Seemed like the thing to do. He even says some of the people were starting to leave, get nervous and leave. And I didn't want them to leave, so I offered sacrifice for them. Nope. No justification. King Isaiah in 2 Chronicles 26. He thought that things were good. Thought he could do something that he could not do. Well, in a book called Give Praise to God, there are two ways to commit idolatry. Go to the chart, if you will. Two ways to commit idolatry. Worship something other than the true God. Or worship the one true God in the wrong way. I like that. It's a pretty good book, by the way. Giving praise to God and talks about how really give how how to really give praise to God. <clears throat> so self-imposed religion, <clears throat> vain religion, ignorant religion is all wrong. Why? Because I don't like it? No. Because God didn't authorize it. So if God did not authorize something, it cannot be done with God's sanction, nor does He accept it. Now friends, what is the purpose of our worship? Why do we worship? Do we go to worship to be served, or do we go to serve? The primary purpose of worship is to honor and glorify God. We read passages right at the beginning in Psalm 95 and 96, and also as you go over Revelation 14, those who praise of the heavenly host are doing honor and glory unto the Lord God, for He alone is worthy of praise. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts unto the Lord. All right. So worship to God is certainly to honor and to glorify Him, but it has to be done in His way. When we worship in spirit and in truth, we bind ourselves up to the truth, and we build ourselves up in the truth when we bind ourselves to the truth. All right? We worship in spirit and in truth. All right? Well. Worship in spirit and in truth honors God. It edifies us, or should. And notice, it increases our knowledge of God and increases our understanding of our duties to one another. It increases our faith in God. It increases our unity and our fellowship. It increases our love for God. And it increases our love for one another when we worship the right way, friends. Now, notice those aspects of our worship. It increases our knowledge of God. Now, when our knowledge of God increases, it increases our understanding of our duties to follow what God says, and therefore to do unto others as we are told to do. When our worship increases our faith in God, it increases our unity and our fellowship as we come together in our worship. Okay? And when we increase our love for God through our worship, we increase our love for one another as we worship God together because it has meaning, you see. And notice there's an urgency. There is a closeness that we feel when we pay homage to the same God. And we're not really concerned about what this person feels or that person feels or about whether we're doing this as a group or whether we have a mosh pit that where everybody's kind of laid back and just kind of floating, you know. 
and whether we're all into the music and all that type of thing. No, we're into God, you see. And he is the focus of our worship. Not the effects of the music or the appeal of some type of message that is being given over and over and over again to kind of get you to feeling kind of floating and get into the situation. What are some general principles that should govern all of our worship? Again, John 4, 24, Jesus said, that's there you go with authority. Jesus said, worship to me must be done in spirit, that's deep, deep faith, and in truth, with all I have, and in truth. So if I do it in spirit, but I don't do it in truth, have I pleased God? Or if I do it in truth, as the Pharisee, but I do not do it in spirit, have I pleased God? No. <clears throat> so our worship must be in spirit, the right attitude, which would be reverent and humble, and in truth, and notice that would be the right actions, the ones only authorized by God's Word. <clears throat> and notice we must do this. Those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. So friends, what that says is that true worship is that which is revealed by God. Anything else is vain, is empty, is ignorant, and is invalid before God. But true worship is revealed worship. Now, our worship has to be done for the right purpose, and that is to praise and glorify God. Must be done decently and in order. And here's, here's a big deal with this. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 4, 40, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the regulation of spiritual gifts in chapter 14. And what he's talking about is when you come together, it's a big chaos. He said, you've got this person over here prophesying, this one over here is speaking in tongues, this one over here is being involved in the gift of knowledge, and all these things, and one's singing and one's praying. And he said, it's just a mess. How can God be glorified when there's so much confusion? He said, that's not how it's supposed to be. Let all things be done decently and in order. That means it's not supposed to be some type of, let's just, because we have this gift, let's just use it any old way we want to. No, the spirit of the prophet was subject to the prophet. So the prophet could regulate himself. Simply because he had a gift of tongues didn't mean he had to use them, that he would just get uncontrolled and run around the building. No, that was just absolutely, un, not decently and in order. And there, had, there is an order to our worship. Some say, well, when you organize things, it makes it cold. No, when you organize things, it makes it biblical. God said so. Let all things be done decently and in order. Okay? So is there a way to know what's decent and in order? Yeah, there sure is. And the scriptures teach it. Our worship involves sacrifice in Hebrews 13, verses 14 through 16. And this is a, this is a question some of you have called in and have, t have talked with me before about this idea of why do I have to come to church services? Why do I have to attend an assembly? Well, I have a, I have a report right here in my hand. That is uh, the Pew Research Center, uh, latest research that they have done on the millennials and the different generations, not only the millennials, but the uh, people before that and the people of the, my generation and all those things, and talking about the interests that are, the, the, they were, several people were polled by this research center and they came back, back with the idea of, of uh, why people are the way they are with religion. Several questions were asked. It's a, it's a good survey, actually, if you'd like to look at that. It's the Pew Research Center, and so Google that on your computer when you get a chance, and look it up. But notice that there are a number of people today, and for generations we've been leading toward this, that don't want to involve themselves in any type of giving up anything. Well, you remember when Jesus was asked, how much does it cost to serve me? What will it cost? Well, Jesus told us the cost. Everything we have cost you all of it. 
everything. And so that involves ourselves even in our worship. Okay? Why do we come together to worship God? Because first of all, he commanded it to be done. And next of all, because we are sacrificing ourselves for him. Because he sacrificed himself for us. We should sacrifice ourselves. Now what do we sacrifice compared to what Jesus sacrificed? Well, you know what? It means we have to restructure our life a little bit. And friends, there's some, and maybe hopefully some of you who are listening are members of the Church of Christ. There are a number of members of the Church of Christ that don't come to worship services like they should. They think they can give God, give God just a few minutes here or there, and God should be absolutely thrilled to death that, they, that he got that much time with them. Well, God wants, it, wants to do all he can to be with his people. And that's why that he is in the midst of his people every time they come together. And Hebrews 10 verse 24 and 25 says that we are to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the custom of some is. And so much more as you see the day approaching. You know, there were two days they, they were, had to watch for. One was the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. And the other one was the judgment day. Now the thing we have in common now is there's a judgment day coming, friends. Now where are you going to be when the Lord comes back? Suppose the Lord came back on Sunday. He should be able to find all his people in one place, shouldn't he? But there'll be some off here fishing, some in the deer stand, some out in the boat, you know, some up at Carowinds, some here, some there, because they have stuff to do. Some planning their jobs for next week, some going to the restaurants, some sleeping in. Well, is that sacrificing yourself for the Lord? No. Not at all. You're just doing what you want to do. And you're fitting God in when you can. Now, friends, have you ever heard about the hitchhiker Christian? The hitchhiker Christian is the one that wants to ride in the car, your car. He wants to ride on your gas, your gas. You spend the money for it. He wants you to upkeep your car so it doesn't break down. He's inconvenienced. And he wants you to pay the insurance. And he wants you to do this and you to do that for him. And he wants you to arrive at the destination on time and do what you're supposed to and, and, and all those things. And then he wants to make sure and let you know that if you, you better not have an accident. Because if you have an accident, he'll sue you. Yeah. So he'll be all over you if you mess up. But he is asking you to give him a free ride. Well, you know that's what a lot of people want people that come to church services to do for them. Well, so-and-so goes to church services and they're all there and so the doors are open so I don't have any obligation. I don't have to be there. Well, those are hitchhiker Christians. That's exactly what they are. They're just riding along on the coattails of other people. But they're not about to get themselves the least bit sacrificial. They'll do what's convenient. And that's what people are doing in contemporary worship. They're conveniently worshiping God, as long as it appeals to them, as long as they're happy, as long as it gives them a thrill. But when it comes down to it, they're not willing to sacrifice anything for the Lord themselves. And so that's vain worship. That's empty worship. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, friends, very important passage. You know, years ago, there was an old song. I think it's a country song that was out there. Give me that old-time religion. Yeah. Well, one of the verses there is just not right because it says it was good enough for mom and daddy, so it's good enough for me. Well, friends, if, if you're talking about the religion of the Bible was good enough for mom and dad, that's, that's fine. But if you're talking about mom and dad picked out one of the many religions and they, they did that, so we're just going to follow what they say, no, 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 you don't follow that that way. You follow what the Bible says. And the old time religion is what the Bible says. The old paths, wherein is the right way, Jeremiah 6, 16. Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 6, 16, read it. Stand in the paths and the way and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your soul. Sad thing in Jeremiah's day though. Last part of that verse is, they said, we will not walk in those ways. We don't want to walk in the old paths. 
We want to chart a new course. We want a fresh frontier, and we're going to make our own way. We're going to forge our own path to God. The old one didn't work for us, so we're going to forge a new path. That is the appeal, the appeal of the rebel heart and of the person who is unwilling to submit to God's ways, but is perfectly willing to submit to their own devices. Well, let's look at what the Bible teaches about old-time religion. What is it all about? Well, some people say, give me that religion. Give me some beating the time religion. Give me the showtime religion instead of the old religion of the Bible. Is it showtime where you go to church? When you walk in, are you ready for the show? Or are you ready to worship? A lot of difference in there. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people can put on a good show and can entertain a crowd. But that is not why people should come to worship God. You got that? Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you dispossess them, and you dwell in their land, take heed to yourselves that you're not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I will do so likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you to do, you be careful to observe it, and you shall not add to it, and you shall not take away from it. You got that? You read that? Deuteronomy 12, 29-32. What's God saying? When you go into this land that I blessed you to be able to go into, the second generation of wilderness people that are now ready to go into the land, you be careful when you go into that land and you take this land from the people and you go into their houses, which I have given you, you be very careful not to take over the practices of the worship of their gods and worshiping me like they worship their gods. Because I will not be pleased with that. Whatever I command you to do, you be careful, watch this, to do it. Verse 32 of Deuteronomy 12. You shall not add to it, and you shall not take from it. All right. Nadab and Abihu come into mind? Yeah, very much so. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus, who's going to judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. You preach the word. Don't preach your opinion. Don't preach some type of mood-altering type of concept. The word of God's powerful, stand alone like it is. You preach it and you teach it. Be ready in season and out of season. You can reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Here's why. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's the old paths. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers who will turn their ears away from truth. And they shall be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. You endure afflictions, and you do the work of an evangelist, Timothy, and you fulfill your ministry. Don't you fold, don't you cave to preaching it their way. You preach it God's way. You demand of them that they do what God says, and you have the authority of God behind you when you preach the word. Friends, what we are hearing today in contemporary worship is nice, cute little stories. Nice, cute little things that are peppered about with nice, cute little illustrations. 
and entertainment again by some speakers that are very capable, by the way. And they could use their talents when they would put, if they would put it to God's purposes in such a good way. But no, they have gone after themselves. They have become teachers who are teaching it whatever way the people want. You remember in the Old Testament how there came a sad time in Israel when you could buy a priest for the highest price? You could have your own personal priest that would tell you just exactly what you wanted to do and authorize it. There's been a time in, our, in history, uh, in, our, in our recent history, in the last five, six hundred years, when people have been able to do that in, overseas. Buy your own priest, and he'll authorize whatever you want him to authorize. Is that what we want? Is that the type of preaching that you want? You know, when I started preaching over 40 years ago, full time, my dad said, if it ever gets to the point where you think about selling out the gospel to make the people happy, you get out of the pulpit. And I've remembered that. You do not let people dictate to you what truth is. And when somebody asks you not to preach on something, that's probably a good time to preach on it. People want to just have you scratch their ears. Well, friends, I hope that all of us will always remember that the power of the gospel is in the gospel. And the preacher has no authority to scratch the ears of the people and give them soothing words. Prophesy unto us, the ancients said in the, in the times of the prophets. Give us smooth words. Don't rattle our cage. Don't give us something we have to do to change. We just want the smooth words. Well, friends, that might fill a building, but it will not save your soul. That type of preaching won't do that. And friends, there's a place in Houston that is eaten up with contemporary worship. And what the man there does is he says, I find out what the people want and I give them all of it they can stand. Is that preaching, the gospel? Is that the appeal of the truth? Is that the old paths? Or is that just exactly what Timothy said, the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine. But they just want somebody to scratch their ears. God save us, brethren and friends, tonight from ever getting to the point where we are more concerned with how many people we have in an assembly and whether we're making them happy than we are with making God happy. We're all about pleasing God, not about pleasing people. What's missing in contemporary worship? And by the way, another report I have right here, and the subject is how contemporary worship is shaping us for better and for worse. I want to read something to you. This was written by, again, by a man that is in a denomination. And he talks about the practices of contemporary worship, particularly related to the music of it. But he says here, and I'm quoting, it's worth noticing that contemporary worship people, the ones who love it, describe worship as an experience of receiving blessing from God rather than responding to God's majesty with praise. What's the point? He says it shifts one's focus toward themselves rather than toward God. And that is a danger of contemporary music. And by the way, he's not totally against it, but he sees some dangers with it. My fear is that in the contemporary worship movement, we have too often trained people to seek a caffeine jolt of emotional bliss rather than to be touched by the gospel of Christ. True. Amen. Well, contemporary worship, he says, is what these parachurches are doing. And 
Worship is becoming a concert. It is becoming a performance, he says. He says, goes on to say here, he says, stage lights, fog machines, and whale of sound arrangements are what is passing for praise to God when singing is what God would expect. Again, he's not even a member of the Church of Christ. But he says that. Modern praise to God has become professionalized. You have to be a trained musician to praise God properly. And that's not what the Bible says, friends. We've already talked about that. The worship experience and contemporary worship services has become irreducibly audiovisual and visual and tactile. In other words, appeals to the sight, to the sound, to the touch, the emotions, and not to the Bible. A number of other things he says, since my days of being a young child, he, this is the same guy, I've been raised in contemporary worship. New songs, upbeat music, and exuberant participation from the congregation in the forms of singing, raising hands, dancing, and shouting is all I've ever known. But he goes on to say, the more I grow in Christ, the longer I am a preacher, the more I see that contemporary doesn't mean better. The truth is, the greatest realities in life are old. The gospel is old news, and it is a precious news. But it has more relevance today than anything that contemporary music and worship can throw at us. New isn't always novel, nor is new always true, nor is new always wrong. New that is couched in what the scriptures teach is really in essence not new. Most of the time it's better to look back and learn what are we missing. And this author goes on to say sometimes I wonder if our emphasis on contemporary worship clouds our perspective. Well I would answer yes it does. And then he goes on and causes us to miss the elements of biblical worship that are essential to formation and development of a true respect for God himself as a higher God, not an equal God. That's a guy that was grew up in contemporary worship. Friends, more and more people are realizing what this author did, that contemporary worship is at best a fad that will burn out as quickly as it came in. I hope so. And I hope that people will begin to recognize that just because you put a lot of excitement into something and you try to manufacture a feeling does not mean that that feeling is real. Have you ever been in a crowd of people? Have you ever seen somebody, old farmer farmed all of his life, he goes to a ball game and they start doing the wave and he does. He's never shown any expression or anything, but all of a sudden he gets in the crowd, get him frenzied up and he does the wave like everybody else does. Why did he do that? Yeah, because everybody else was doing it. Did he feel like a loyal member of that team afterwards? When his first game he'd ever, no. He just went along with the crowd. Was there any substance to what he did? No, but he did it. And while he was doing it, he had fun. But then when he went back to the farm, there's nothing particular to take with him, was there? But when you come to a worship service in the gospel way, like the gospel says, you know what you come away with? A changed life, if you do it right. And it, it is substantial worship. This man went on to say, many youth today are absolutely flocking to churches that have great music, purely from a musical point of view, when it's professional. 
But he says, as a contemporary person came coming up in contemporary music, he says, God save us from the people that think they can play and they can't. The doctrine being taught in these churches is so off the wall and unbiblical. In fact, I honestly believe the devil is using music to draw young naive soul, souls into such churches. I know of some who will fiercely disagree with what I say. But we've too, put too much value in our worship in the style instead of in the content. We should go, grow, go where we grow the most, where the Word of God is taught and respected, and where it saturate, saturates and permeates not only the congregation, but the hearts of the people in that congregation. It's a mouthful, isn't it? Here's a contemporary person that says you need to go where the Word of God and truth saturate the heart and the congregation, hearts of individuals and the heart of the church. That's what you need. Now he's come out of contemporary worship. And he's appealing to people to seek the old paths where it is the right way. Friends, that's what we've done. I've done it here for eight years in, on this program. And what this, what this program has brought to you is an appeal to the old paths. Not some new gimmick, because the gimmicks will change as time changes and as the whims of men change. And the gospel will still be there, ringing forth bravely across all time, calling men across the sea of sin into Jesus Christ. And we have begged you to come to Christ not to come and worship with us because we have the most spiffy religion and the greatest band and all the greatest effects. No. Because at the end of the day, guitars decay and horns, well, they just get obnoxious. But the Word of God stands for it, doesn't it? What's happening where you go? Are you going somewhere now where traditional is waning and where contemporary is almost trying to take over? Well, let me tell you something. If you do things God's way and make sure that everybody appeals to a, thus saith the Lord for what you do, you have a standard. Contemporary worship, friends, and notice the breakdown in this chart. It's a pretty good chart of what the breakdown of contemporary music is all about, or contemporary worship. You have the ancient and future blended contemporary worship. That's where people try to make the idea that we can have it both ways. We're going to have a traditional service and a future service, or a contemporary. Then there's the Pentecostal experience of contemporary music, and that's the idea that we just lose ourselves in emotion. We just get caught up in whatever we feel like doing. Somebody wants to run around the building and get lathered up. They do that and they say that that's all about God. And then there's an emergent concept with contemporary worship. And that's the idea is we need to stand and, and sit back and, and talk about the idea of what's the latest thing on the block. What's the most a uh, cutting edge thing, and excuse me with that, I'm going to cut that off right now um, because we're on the TV program. Um, I'll give those people a call in just a minute. And then there's the, the seeker sensitive type of contemporary worship. That's where people try to find out what the seeker wants and then they give it to them. Okay? And then there's the modern contemporary, and that's where again where you want to stay with the crowd. Whatever the crowd wants, whatever the crowd likes, uh, you appeal to that and that changes. And as that changes, your appeal is to whatever the crowd asks for. Now again, are any of these scriptural? Absolutely not. Not a one of them is. But these are the different nuances of contemporary worship. Well. What is meant by contemporary worship? It's not the idea that it is, contemporary means occurring in the modern or of the day. And certainly all of us, our worship is of the day or in the modern right now. I don't worship back in 33 AD. 
But the pattern set in 33 AD is what I worship by today because that was set by God long ago. And notice worship is reverence suffered, offered to a divine being or supernatural power. An act of expressing such reverence is what is called worship. We'd already talked about that definition. Now, defining contemporary worship, notice this is how contemporary worship people say you should decide and see whether you're a contemporary worship person. If your church has a band, you'd be considered contemporary. If your instrumentation consists of the piano and the organ, in denominations, you would probably fall in the traditional mode. Well, I would say that that would be contemporary also. The traditional mode would be truly biblical mode, would be when there is only singing, praise to God congregationally. Because that's what God commanded in Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19. All right? Well, contemporary is a genre of worship today that is taking on, that has come up in the last 30 years. First, and John 4.24, going back to what God says as opposed to what man says, there's only one style of worship that honors God, friends, and that pleases Him, and that is that which comes from a humble, submissive, and sincere heart. And God seeks such people to, pray, to honor Him. But it is a type of worship that is spirit and truth worship. Now, if you want to stir the pot up among the contemporary people, then you talk about faith alone. You talk about once saved, always saved, or any church will do. You talk about those subjects and talk about how no, not any church will not do. There's only one church. When you talk about once saved, always saved, and you say the Bible doesn't teach such a doctrine, that'll stir the pot. When you talk about faith alone and go to James 2 and say faith without works is dead, that will stir the pot among the contemporary worship people or those who sympathize with it. And brethren, let's not sit back. I'm talking to my brethren now. Let's not sit back and talk about contemporary music, uh, worship being something that everybody else does because we're coming dangerously close to these types of things when we don't want these types of old, old paths teaching to be done. Now, when does it start? How do people get involved in contemporary worship? Well, it starts somewhere, doesn't it? Well, one, one man that I know, and I've talked to him on the phone several times, don't know him personally, but I have talked with him. He, he did a survey <clears throat> in his congregation where he preached. He's a member of the Church of Christ, preaches for the Church of Christ. And he asked the people there. He asked them, he says, I'm going to be, preach a lesson on contemporary worship this Sunday. I've preached on this before, <clears throat> and I just wondered what some of you might think about this. Now this was in the congregation where he was. Now those of you who are my brethren think seriously about this. Some of the responses questioned why he should ever preach such a sermon and said it would be a wasted sermon. And then one said you might as well preach about snake handling. We don't have a problem with that. And then one said I've never heard a sermon about this. I don't know what you're talking about. And then one said, rock and pop music is not the same as entertainment. And then one said, what would contemporary worship look like in a congregation of God's people? What would it look like? Well, fact is, not far from here, over around eastern North Carolina, in Cresswell, there's a church that has a contemporary service at 8, 8.30, Church of Christ. And then they have a traditional service at 10.45. They'll preach it any old way you want. You have it either way. Now, 
at that church they say we will use the piano, organs, flutes, percussion, guitars every Sunday morning. It's the Church of Christ for our contemporary worship. But for our traditional worship, we will, we will tone it back to congregational singing. Now that's in church. How does that happen? When people stop seeking for the old paths, wherein is the right way, that's how that happens. And it starts slowly. It starts with discontent over preaching hard. It starts with discontent over preaching the things of the gospel in kindness and love, but with sternness and compassion but also with strength and no compromise. That's how it starts. People say, ah, that's chasing people away. That won't help convert anybody, they say. Well, it's been doing it for years. But yet we're told, no, not today. These are by those who call themselves Christians. Charles Spurgeon years ago said this. He said when we unite stage and church, cards and prayer, dancing and sacraments, if we're, powerful, if we're powerless to stem the torrent, we can at least warn men that it exists. We can tr warn them and entreat them to make sure they keep out of it. When the old faith is gone and enthusiasm for the gospel is extinct, it's no wonder that people seek something else in the way of delight. Lacking bread, they feed on ashes and reject the way of the Lord. Rejecting the way of the Lord, they run greedily in the path of stupidity. They were a lot stronger preachers back then. Spurgeon wouldn't have been able to say that in many congregations today. They'd been considered rude. But he spoke the truth here on this. Why don't congregations see and why don't people see that's uh, what's happening with contemporary music? Well, they're concerned about slow growth. And we all should be concerned about slow growth. The cultural changes that begin began back in, in my generation was, was the 60s. The rebellion, the rock and roll, which rock all rock and roll, hasten to say, is not sinful. But with the sex and the drugs and do it your way and whatever feels good, do it, that type of concept, that's where it started. That type of mindset in society permeated the church. And so what we have now is much, for, much further away from what God has in mind than what God wants his people to preach about today. I want you to want to read an advertisement for a church called Momentum. You can see it more and more of this. We call them community churches, and they say they're non-denominational. But they're non-denominational denominations is what they are. Momentum advertises itself this way. Momentum is not your mama's church. It's a church for people who don't like church. We rock it out every Sunday. We want urban and rock musicians, sweet lead guitarists, funky, funky bass players and smooth drummers. We want turntable DJs and rappers and vocalists. In addition to modern worship music, we cover Imagine Dragons in our, in our service. We cover Linkin Park and John Legend and other mainstream artists every week. Our auditions year round and on Wednesday happen here and you can contact us here if you can rock we want to see you musicians wanted by the momentum church well Hebrews 2 and verse 1 therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard lest we drift away and mark it friends digression happens by drifting not by wholesale drowning. 
you drift out, you get overwhelmed. You think you're okay, and next thing you know, you're overwhelmed because your mindset has you've let your guard down. In Judges 21 through 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And you can see this again in Judges 2 and verse 7. In Jeremiah 2, 13, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn themselves out cisterns that are broken cisterns that can hold no water at all. Apostasy from the faith is a change in attitude, and that's where it starts. A change in attitude toward God's ways and God's word. Friends, turn to Psalm chapter 95 and verse 8. Psalm 95 and verse 8. It really talks about how this happens, how people go so far away so quickly. Again, it seems like it's quick, but it's been happening for a number of years. A lot of the things that we're experiencing today have been working a long time. And it happened very gradually. In verse 8 of 90, chapter 95, Psalm 95. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, as in the days of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me, and they saw my works. Forty years long I was grieved with this generation, and I said these are people that err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. And I swear, swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. That's a strong passage. God says it started where? They hardened their hearts to what was true. Psalm 101, if you have your Bibles, in verse 4. 101 and verse 4. Look there, if you will. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know those who are wicked. Romans 1, verse 21 and 22. Talking of the Gentile world, Paul says here that they refused to have God in their knowledge and so God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do that which was evil in his sight. God gave them over. God will not stop us from doing wrong, but he will judge us for what we do. So we have a choice. Do we follow the ways of God? Do we be convicted in what we're teaching and convicted and convinced that it's right? Stand for it, not back off of it, but stand firm, putting on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Or will we change the right ways of God? In 2 Peter 3, verse 1 through 6, or verse 16, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Where's the book, chapter, and verse for contemporary worship, friends? And we'll all do it. But in the absence of the scripture, we will sit back and say, we will follow the old paths, <coughs> wherein is the right way. We will preach the word. We'll be urgent in season and out of season. There's too much emphasis on style over substance in our preaching. Now, again, there were people like Apollos, who was an eloquent man, who was very effective in his teaching of the Word of God. It is not a sin to be a good speaker. Not a sin to have a good style. But friends, when we are looking at the, with the style of a man over what he's preaching, we have come off what God wants. When we put standards on people and say their, their standard must meet my certifications rather than God's certifications. Is this man that preaches the gospel pleasing to God? That's what counts, folks. Not is they pleasing to every people, all the people, see. There's a de-emphasis in the scriptures today and in churches today on biblical authority. If you preach about biblical authority, you're called a traditionalist. You're called a legalist. People are critical of those who contend earnestly for the faith. 
and hold fast to the apostolic traditions of 2 Timothy, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. We need to start, quit measuring ourselves by what others want. We need to quit measuring ourselves by what we have done. When we look back and we move further and further away from God, there's a starting point and there's an ending point. The ending point will be judgment, when we're called into judgment for what we do. Well, why don't churches see where they're going? Because many of them are unlearned. The members are unlearned. And all it takes is one generation to be untaught. And you have a generation that arises that does not know God. Old Testament principle. We need to teach on Bible authority. We need to teach on what God says regarding worship. And we've done that in the last four shows, talking about the worship of God and what it should be. In 1 Peter 4.11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. Comprehensive natures of New Testament teaching never has stopped. The comprehensive nature of the New Testament scriptures will never stop. The scriptures are true. They are able to furnish us completely unto every good work that means every new idea that comes up that really is not a new idea, it's just a repackaged old one. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, friends. We cannot know the mind of God except through what He has revealed to us. God has revealed everything He wants us to know and everything He wants us to do, all things pertaining to life and godliness. We are furnished completely unto every good work and Jude 3, we are to contend earnestly for what we know to be true. And that is God's Word. We are to fight for it. Contend for it. Okay? Walking by faith, friends, means walking by what God says. Are you doing that? Are you walking by what God says or by what you think? Are you endorsing what pleases men or what pleases God? Remember when Jesus was asked the question, where did you get the authority for what you're teaching? Did it come from heaven or did it come from men? Matthew 21. And that really is, it, are the only two choices. Does everything come from God that we are doing or our practices from God or from men? If they're coming from men, then guess what? Then it is not authorized by God. And it's just that simple. You know, the Lord has several places where He just goes, okay, it's this way or that way. There's no in-between. You can't ride the fence. Did it come from men or from God? Now, there's only two possible sources. Where did the playing of things, where did the playing of the crowds with contemporary music come from? And with contemporary worship. Where does the Bible authorize making melody with a guitar? or a mechanical instrument of music of any kind. And you'll find the Bible pretty silent about that. Now where does it, where does it authorize singing? Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, and numerous other places that we could cite. Well, many don't understand the need to establish authority. They don't even care about it. Now, some say, well, you know, you have songbooks, you have buildings, you have lights, you have HVACs, you have pews, you have windows, so those are additions. Well, people don't understand authority again and don't know that these are expedients. They don't change the command to do these things, just like a hammer didn't change the command to build the ark. But the Lord didn't tell him what kind of hammer to use, how many of them to use. But he did spe specify gopher wood. He did specify one window and one door and to pitch it within and without. But how, what saw to use? No, that was an expedient to get the boat built. Okay? But again, if a person doesn't understand authority or how we get authority, that'll just be like talking Greek to them. All right? We cannot substitute things for God's Word that He has authorized. We have to abide by what He has said. Okay? So are we abiding by the doctrine of Christ or are we going for the things of the world? Contemporary 
worship that is permeating a lot of churches today is not of God. Now, John MacArthur Jr. said this, if you get bored in church, may I suggest to you that it's not a com commentary on the sermon. It's a commentary on your heart. Even if the sermon isn't particularly worth listening to, the chance to pick up some truth about God's Word that comes through it should be the most exhilarating time of your life. If you're uninterested or indifferent, it's not a commentary on the sermon. It is a commentary on you, and I like that. And that doesn't, that is not to excuse sorry preaching, okay? Now, focusing on the carnal and not the spiritual is what it comes down to with contemporary versus spiritual worship and biblical worship, okay? Now, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you done what the Bible says? Hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Okay. Gospel meeting, remember, June the 14th through the 16th at the Newton Church of Christ. It meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. 828-465-3009 is where we will find that uh, phone number for the church building. You can go on uh, your email at contact at wordandsword.com and ask for a ride. We will be glad to pick you up. We invite you to attend assemblies at the 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. 9.30 for worship, 11 o'clock for, or 9.30 for Bible study, 11 o'clock for worship, and then Bible study at 7 o'clock. Uh, the program is brought to you wholly by the Newton Church of Christ. Uh, email, contact at wordandsword.com, and there's the other information, and you can just mail us a letter if you want to at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina. Next show, June the 18th. And friends, we want you to think seriously about coming back to us, if you will, and being with us on June the 18th. Again, we have talked about contemporary worship. And if you want to worship God properly, according to the pattern of the New Testament, we urge you to investigate the nearest Church of Christ close by to you. Some of you are in different areas, not close to Newton. If you're close by to Newton, come and be with them and enjoy their worship with them. Thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate so much the honor of being in your home, and we bid you a good evening.